A customer is the most important visitor on our premises. We're dependent on him. He's the purpose of our work. Now, Gandhi said this well over 100 years ago, but it's still very, very relevant today. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for the intro, Andy. My name's Trenton, and I'm very, very fortunate enough to run a, a wonderful user experience agency up in London called Web Credible. And I'm here today to try to prevent something from occurring for you. So what a lot of people do when you run a website or run a business is you often tend to do a lot of tinkering. So let's say with the example of a website or with uh, digital marketing, you often tweak things about, try and change things and try and optimize things. And I know Chris from Adido is doing a great talk on optimization later on today. But one thing that you really need to be sure of, and one thing that I don't want you to be doing, is putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> a pig is still a pig, even if it's wearing lipstick. And if you are going to be, if you are managing a website or managing a digital marketing campaign and doing lots of tweaks and doing it perhaps not as well as you might be doing it, you will be doing this. You will be putting lipstick on a pig. So how do we stop doing this? How do we create amazing <coughs> digital experiences? That's what I want you to be doing. I want you to be making those amazing digital experiences and not having the pig around. So to make an amazing digital experience, there are three things that need to be at the core of that experience. What you're trying to achieve as a business, obviously. And that should be at the core of what you're doing, right? Otherwise, why are you doing it? And ideally, that should be communicated across your business so everyone is aligned around those business objectives. The other core of that amazing experience should be the, the product features, what it is that your, your service or product is, obviously. So those two are usually there. But the one that's missing, and the one that so often contributes to that experience not being amazing, is you not truly understanding the needs of your customers. And it's only when you truly understand the needs of your customers and you put that into the mix that I would suggest you can get that amazing digital experience. So let's talk a bit about those customer needs. How do we gather customer needs? How do we truly understand the needs and the goals and requirements of our customers and the problems that they're trying to solve? Well, the first thing that you need to remember is that your customers are absolutely not designers. The other thing that you should never ever do is ask your customers what they want. Because the problem with asking people what they want is that people don't think how they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. <laughs> so how are we going to do this? How are we going to get a true understanding of our customers? How are we really going to understand what their needs and their goals are, and the problems that perhaps they don't even know about that, that need solving? Well, what we need to do is take the time out to understand our customers. And there's four stages to this, to really bring in that customer understanding into your product development process and making sure that you can offer an amazing digital experience for your customer. Now, this doesn't apply to just digital, just an amazing experience for your customers. So the first thing we need to do is identify who our customers are. And again, most businesses are quite good at this. You should, you should know who your customers are, right? In terms of age and demographics and those sort of things. But the next step is the one that's really important that you really should be doing. Take the time out to understand your customers. And the only way you're going to be able to do this is to spend time with them, to run research, to interview them, and to really understand what they're trying to achieve and what their goals are. Now I promise you, and I'll take this bet against any of you if you want to bet against me, I promise you none of your customers have the goal of interacting with your brand. None of your customers have the goal of buying your product. Your brand and your product is a means to an end. It's a means to an end to achieve a bigger goal. What is that bigger goal? What is that need that they're trying to fulfill on? And what are those problems that they're trying to solve? And it's only by going out and spending time with your customers or potential customers, talking to them, asking these questions, and getting a really deep understanding of that end-to-end -end customer journey from I think I might want to do something through to doing that thing and buying products along the way and interacting with brands either in person or through social or through other digital channels. And only when you truly understand that journey and that bigger picture goal that people are trying to achieve, well then you understand your customers. And once you gain that understanding, then you can start to design those amazing digital experiences. So you really understand what their needs and goals are, and you've identified problems. And these might even be problems that people don't know they have. 
But by doing that research, by spending time with customers, you've realized there are problems they're experiencing. Well, let's solve those problems. And let's create some new experiences based on those needs and that help people achieve that bigger picture end goal and that help people solve those problems. And what you shouldn't do is design that experience and spend ages doing it and launch it and invest lots of money in it. Well, you should do that. But along the way, you've got to be constantly testing and iterating. So whatever experience you're thinking of creating, build prototypes, build rough and ready uh, little models of it and constantly be testing it with users and running research with users as you go along the way. Research doesn't need to be very time consuming or very expensive. You can do it very rough and ready in style and still get very, very good results. And ideally, everything you're doing as a business, all your product development, you should have research embedded, both to define that strategy and that roadmap and to constantly be testing it throughout to make sure that what you're doing is working and is right and tweaking it. And if we do all of that and throw in our business goals and throw in our product features, then you can start to make some, some really amazing digital experiences. And when you're doing all of this, you've really got to be thinking about all the different ways that consumers and your customers might be interacting with you. And hey, did you know we live in a multi-channel world? So of course customers can, or well, depending on your brand, interact with you face to face, through desktop, laptop, PC, social, email, telephone, <coughs> some or all of those channels will apply to you. And of course you've got to be thinking about all of these channels. Multi-channel's fine, cross channels a lot better. It's when you start to obviously join up these channels and it becomes a bit more coherent for users who can then jump between channels and interact with you. So things like click and collect is an obvious example where you use your desktop or your phone to order a product and then you go in store to pick it up. That's an example of cross-channel, right? But far, far better than that is omni-channel. Your customers, I promise you, your customers will expect this because you expect it from every brand that you interact with. You expect that if you interact with a brand through a website or an app or through a telephone call or in store that the journey continues, that you don't have to re-explain yourself every time. You expect that brand to know you from those other interactions. It's very difficult for large companies to do this because obviously they're in silos. But for smaller companies, it's a bit easier. So when you're creating these new experiences and thinking about you know, solving consumer customer problems and fulfilling on their goals, think about it within that omni-channel remit. How can we create that consistent experience no matter how our customers want to interact with us? And one company that does this really, really well is Burberry. They've been doing it well for years. And They've got an app, very helpful, some really nice little features. You search for your nearest store and it automatically brings up directions to it. Which is a nice little touch. But they've also got My Burberry in, uh, integrated into the app. My Burberry is amazing. It follows you around, oh, kind of like a bad smell. Wherever, however you want to interact with Burberry, your My Burberry goes with you. So My Burberry is on the app and of course it's on the website as well. But they've got some lovely little touches on the website. This looks like a pretty standard e-commerce page, right? But if you go down just to this little section here, you've got your standard add to bag here. You can save it to my Burberry, so you can access it later. You can continue the journey in store by requesting an appointment. And when you request the appointment, everything that's in your my Burberry will get, the staff store assistant will get notified of all of that. You can continue the conversation on a telephone call or chat live or even interact with them on social media. So the journey is seamless. Such a tiny part of that web page, but the amount of internal organization and toing and froing that must have gone on to make that happen would have been phenomenal. They've got a tablet app as well, which links over to uh, other social media channels where they can display content better, so Tumblr obviously being a very visual medium. And finally, they've got their flagship store in Regent Street, which is amazing. And next time you're up in London and you're around the West End, go into their Regent Street store. It is specifically designed to be an extension of their digital channel. They are assuming that everyone who goes in there has looked at their products on the website before. So how's this for a user journey? You go in store, having been on the website, looked at a few products you like, they've gone into My Burberry, chat to a store assistant who brings out their iPad, you log into My Burberry, and the store assistant instantly knows the products that you're into and what your tastes are. So that conversation, if you can call it a conversation, that you've already been having with them through their website, continues. Have you ever gone into a store where you haven't had to start a conversation from scratch with a store assistant? 
Oh, that's brilliant. And then the store assistant says, well, well, why don't you go and sit down on this comfy sofa and you know, use our Wi-Fi, play, with, play around with your phone for a while, and I'm going to use our specially installed high-speed escalators and lifts to whiz around these stores and get the items that you like and a few others that you haven't thought of that I think will work for you. Because, you know, we don't want to wait online, do we? So why would you wait when you're in store? So the store assistant does that, gets everything for you. You go into the changing room, try on your first outfit, little micro trip in the arm, gets picked up by the mirror, shows you a video. Shows you a video of the designer talking about the inspiration behind why they designed it that way. Of the model walking down the catwalk. Check this out. Product people who bought this also bought these. Just like you're on a, on a website, but in store. And it's keeping that omni-channel experience going. And think about how this applies to you. So Burberry is a multi-billion uh, multi pound uh, global retailer with resources that perhaps many of you here can't really match. But what can you do? What can you do from that kind of omni-channel approach to make sure that everything is consistent no matter how your customers interact with you? So I talked about research. It really is all about research. Get that understanding of your audiences really truly understand them. Don't just understand them from the point of view of why they might want to buy your product or how, it's, how you're going to be able to sell to them, but understand them from the point of view of that bigger picture. What is that, that end goal that they're trying to solve? And what problems do they have that you might be able to solve for them as well? And I'll talk through a few examples of, of where this applies. So we do a lot of work with Confuse.com. And one thing we know from our research is that engagement with the price comparison sites is lower than zero. I mean, it's through the floor in terms of negativity. Uh, I suspect all of you here have used a price comparison site before. And if you ask someone a week after they've done a switch, well, which price comparison site did you use? I don't know. Think there might have been a Meerkat somewhere. Well, which provider did you switch to? I don't know. No one cares, right? So what we knew from that, this initial research was that well, no one cares. Brand loyalty is very zero. We know from very low to, to zero. We know from the stats that everyone's just coming in from Google searching for cheap car insurance, and they might recognize the brand from the adverts on telly, think, oh, yeah, it's trustworthy. But what we know, because brand loyalty is so low, because it's such a necessary evil purchase, because filling in this form is so painful, we know that, that we need to make sure this is the most pain-free, easy-to-use process that exists on the internet. And because we did that research up front, and we've got everyone in the business involved, watching some of the research live, reporting about the findings, everyone gets it. So now, when it comes to designing these experiences, everyone in the business is on board. We need to make this super easy. So then we can start to come up with some nice ideas for, for solving problems. You know, no one likes doing this, that's a problem. So how do we try and solve that? How do we make it as easy as possible, as quick and as pain-free as possible? So one thing we did, for example, is we've, we got rid of drop-down menus because they're a bit clunky, a bit difficult to use. Everything gets brought out as buttons, obviously much easier for touch, uh, but also easier on a desktop. And we've got the 95% rule, so that if any of the answers, all the answers that fall within the 95% most common answers are displayed on the page, and the 5% of edge cases gets hidden behind a more button, otherwise we're overwhelming people with lots of choices, and you can see that for the first one. 95% of people choose Mr, Mrs or Miss, and then a few edge cases choose the other ones. So lots and lots of things are baked in research here. Tiny, tiny things to optimize the hell out of this and reduce that friction. Because for a brand like Confuse.com, it's not about how we can delight users, it's how we can get that friction as close as possible to zero. There's no delighting in here. In fact, brand loyalty is so low, truth, the number one reason people call their call center is to say, where's my meerkat? <laughs> True story. So one thing we knew from the research the stats didn't show this, but the research showed it, was that when people got to filling in their contact details, they paused, they worried, they weren't exactly sure. They, they went through, but they felt a bit apprehensive about it. And the stats weren't showing drop-offs on here, but we could see in the research that people were very apprehensive. So we designed lots of, we came up with lots of ideas for the sort of messaging that we could use, tested it with users, and ended up with this, which showed to be the one that reassured users the quickest. And that we're not building big systems here, right? We're just mocking up some very quick designs, getting people in really quickly, testing out these ideas and seeing what works best and keep moving. Research doesn't need to be time consuming or expensive, but it should be baked into everything that you do. Every question here has been optimized. So this last question about when you got your license. So again, when we're doing our research and all of the sites say, what year did you, 
did you pass your driving license? What, what year did you, did you get your driving license and pass your test? And what we saw in the research time and time again was everyone sitting there like, oh, I don't know what year I passed. Well, let me think. I was 17 and I was born in 1957. So when would that be? And it was the same for everyone. And, and so we had this eureka moment. Well, we've already asked them their date of birth. Why don't we just ask them how old they were? And then we can work out what year they passed their, their driving test. Again, it's just doing that little bit of research for all these little sections, just reducing that friction. Again, something else that came out of the research, it's kind of obvious, but we only saw this during the research, was that everyone's filling in the form, and so their mouse is over on the left of the screen, obviously, and then the next button is almost always on the, the, the right of the screen. It's just a standard procedure. And so suddenly they had to spend an extra, whatever, second looking for that next button. Well, let's just bring it back over to the left run some quick research, just check people can find it on the left, and I mean, they could, we weren't really worried about that. So all of this stuff, you're just optimising it based on that research. Oh, by the way, top tip when buying insurance, uh, never, never, um, never renew your insurance. I think many people know that. You, you always get screwed when you renew. Insurance is the weirdest industry where you actually get punished for customer loyalty. So never renew, you will actually get a cheaper quote if you stay with the same provider, but get a new quote rather than renewing. And when you do get your insurance policy, all other things being equal, you will get it cheapest if you get it 21 days before you want it to begin. If you do it the day before, you will pay up to double because they know you're desperate. So 21 days, remember, it's a magic number. Never renew. Any of your insurances, energy, any of that stuff, you will pay more if you renew. So what else did we, we find with our research? Well, some really interesting stuff. Uh, so all of this has just gone live with Confuse, actually. So when you do your next um, uh, insurance switch, you, know, you should use this site because it's by far and away the easiest one out there. <laughs> but one of the other things, really interesting things we found out in our research was about how people interact with the results pages. And it's not a case of people going through the results pages. And you can probably relate to this because you're all users of these sort of sites. It's not that you go to this page and you think, oh, well, I like that one, and oh, I like the look of that one, and I like the look of that one. It's not a case of you choosing the ones you like. It's a case of you deselecting the ones you don't want and then just picking from whatever, whatever's left. And what we found in our research was that was quite hard because you'd, you'd look through it and say, no, not that one, not that one, not that, not that. Okay, which ones are left? Which ones have I gotten rid of? So that's how people are looking for the results. So we just let people get rid of the ones we don't want. And we have a little cross icon there against each one and you get rid of the ones you don't want. So we, te and we tested lots of little ways of doing this. Do we want to put the word hide quote, an X, all sorts of different ways of doing it. The X worked fine, it's a bit minimal. People really like that because now this results page is working in the way that their mental models are working. The other thing we found in the research was that people have very specific requirements about the sort of things that you want in your, in your insurance. So some people, for example, be like, I, I have to have breakdown cover included. I, I won't get insurance without breakdown cover. And the prices that you get there, some of them will include that and some of them won't, because obviously every policy is different. So what we, um, what we did with this is that you just choose your filter options at the top and the price automatically updates. In our research, what we saw was the pain people would have to go through where they'd have to click more info. Okay, so breakdown insurance is 25 pound more, making notes and post-its just wasn't easy. So no one's complaining that that's the problem, but we solved the problem. And that's what research does. It shows you those problems that people don't necessarily complain about, and then you come up with ways of solving them. We do a lot of work with Brompton, for example, uh, the folding bike people. Loads of interesting stuff out of the research. Brompton's a very global brand. Only 20% of their market is the UK. And people buy Bromptons for very, very different reasons around the world. And by understanding this, we can then put different messaging on the site. So in the UK, most people will not consider buying a folding bike if a train journey isn't part of your commute. So I cycle to the station, fold up my Brompton, get on the train and cycle the other end. And people don't, people don't get that actually they are brilliant nippy city bikes. They don't get nicked because you don't leave them out being locked. So there's a lot of reasons why you might get one that people aren't aware of. So for the UK and, U and Europe this applies to, we need to put messaging and imagery on there around, you know, it's a city bike, you use it for your commute, but also some kind of messaging to try and persuade people who don't get about the benefits of other reasons you might get one. In America, people buy Bromlands for a completely different reason. The majority of American cities aren't very cycle friendly. So no one buys bikes to commute around cities, really, in America. But the reason people buy Bromptons is that they'll fit in the car. So I want to go for a jaunt on the weekend. Me and my missus will put a couple of Bromptons in the back of our car, drive out to the countryside and go cycling. 
Completely different use case. In Asia, from our research, what we found was the reason people are buying Bromptons is those living in cities often live in small apartments and they have not got space for a bike. So they buy folding bikes. So our messaging needs to be very different because of that insight that we found. One thing that the site does have is a, um, is a bike builder. And we know that if we get people building bikes, they save that bike and they're more likely to buy. So we really want to make that work and be really effective. And it's a really, oops, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong one. It's a really nifty little feature where you just choose the gears and so on and it, and, it, and it updates it on the fly. But what we found from our research, unsurprisingly, was that you know, novices didn't really get it. Only really experts understood this. So we came up with this, this help me choose section. And this went through design iteration after design iteration, asking user-friendly questions about how you might use your bike. And of course, choosing the colour, most important thing. But in the research, that's the thing people really liked, because then you can visualise it. So we had to have colour in there. Again, that went through numerous iterations of different types of questions, doing it on one page versus multiple pages, and so on and so on. We got 92% um, success rate through that journey now since launch. And we now have a 103% increase in people saving bikes, which means more people are buying. Happy days. Again, it's just through research. It's through understanding those pain points and then trying to come up with a solution that works best to solve those pain points. I'll show you a couple other things quickly. We do a lot of work with Virgin Holidays. And one thing we know with our research with Virgin Holidays, people tend to fall under two camps when looking for your next, your next vacation. You either know where you want to go to or you don't know where you want to go to. But in both occasions, you just go in and you use that fiddly little search feature on travel websites, which makes no sense. If you don't know where you want to go to, why are you using the search feature? So we wanted to come up with a solution. There are two, solution, two problems we're trying to solve here. So trying to get people off the search who shouldn't be using search, so people who don't know where they want to go to, but they're still using the search. So we've come up with a, a simplified version of the search where it's literally just, where can we take you? And underneath it says, not sure, we can help. And the reason we're choosing not sure where to go is that we tried loads of different phrases and the one that resonated with users was, where can we take you? Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, it says not sure, that's me. And it resonated, they got it. It was speaking their language. And the rest of the page is devoted to aspiration helping you choose. The, the other problem we wanted to solve was for people who knew where they wanted to go, it's such a horrible way to start your aspirational journey, right? You're going on holiday, that's exciting but you have to go in and fill in this fiddly little form. So we wanted to solve that problem. Again, no one's complaining about that being a problem to us, but we can see it, that you know, it's just cumbersome with drop downs and radio buttons. So we just changed it to this. We're trying to solve this problem. Again, this went through countless rounds of design iteration and testing to get there. Where can we take you? The one question that's the exciting question, right? That's the aspiration thing. So let's say I want to go to Vegas. Screen swipes across, keeps you on the same page. They don't go to that many destinations, so we could we can have custom imagery for all their destinations. Vegas can't wait for you to arrive. Where, what are you looking for? Big, chunky buttons, great for touch, uh, a lot easier to use than the drop-down menus. And again, we're trying to keep the aspirational thing going. So you choose complete holiday. Now, one thing that we didn't, uh, where it says a complete holiday, we like your style, we only put that in after the research because people were concerned that we didn't remember what they typed in because they couldn't see it on the screen. So we put that complete holiday is right at the front and in bold before asking the next question. Very user-friendly language, as you can see. Same for the uh, progress bar across the top. That wasn't there until the research showed us, again, that people were like, before they hit the final search, when they got towards the end, they were like, well, have you remembered everything I typed in? And have I typed in all the right stuff? So again, we saw that concern from the research, so we solved the problem. <laughs> so using nice human-friendly language, like from 22nd to 29th July, nice you know, user-centered language for the dates. Right, I'm going to show you one more. This is amazing. This is Dulux's app that you may have downloaded. You can paint your walls in the app. Augmented reality. So what I've shown you before is about some quite, I guess, tactical research that's led to tactical design decisions. But research can also lead you to coming up with some really great new products and some really innovative ideas. And you should use research to guide what you're doing. So, you know, trying to solve people's problems that they don't realize are problems. So we do loads of work with Dulux, and we know globally the biggest barrier to people buying paint is arguments with their partner at home. <laughs> really? So we want to decorate our lounge. I think it should look like this, maybe with wallpaper, maybe with these sofas, maybe with this paint, and my missus thinks this. And what happens? Well, we argue. We can't visualize how it's going to look, so there's no way of resolving the argument. Of course she's right. 
let her have that. But there's no way of resolving the argument. There's another barrier to sale. This is mostly in the developed world, not the developing world. We work with them globally. So in the developed world, one of the other barriers to people buying paint or indeed doing decoration is fear. Fear that you're going to do it and that whatever you do, the painting or the wallpaper will be up for, say, two years and all your friends and family are going to come around and judge you. They're going to judge you based on your decorations. Uh, less so in the developing world because if you can afford to get your front room painted, then you can also afford to get it repainted the next week because the cost of labour is so cheap in so many countries that people can just do that. So, but, but basically, so we know this is a problem. Uh, Dulux as a business has a huge problem. Push marketing ain't working so well anymore, as we've, we've heard in many of the sessions today. So they need to get heard above the noise. How can we provide a product that really adds value to our customers? So we did lots of ideation sessions and so on and so on to get to eventually this product that we, that we did with them. So you can do some really great innovation if you understand your customers' pain points and you can start to solve problems. I hope that's been useful and interesting. So hopefully you're getting the point of what I'm saying. Do some research, understand your customers. Don't understand them from the point of view that you probably understand them from now, which is how do I sell products? How do I persuade them to buy my product? Take the time out to truly understand their needs and their goals. What are the needs that they're trying to fulfill on? What bigger picture goal are they trying to complete? The goal is not to buy your product. And what problems could you potentially solve? And then create experiences that fulfill on all of those and, and then test those experiences throughout. Research doesn't need to be costly or expensive. And remember, if you don't do research, if all you do is take what you've got and tinker with it and try and optimize it, then, then you, might be putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs>